You know, it isn't clear that there is a men's movement at all. There, you know, someone I remember, one of the first ones I did in Los Angeles, someone said, um, uh, let's start a men's bookstore called the Whole Men's Bookstore. And I said, well, let's call it the Worried Man's Bookstore. <laughs> so it's possible that there isn't a men's movement, only a group of worried men, <laughs> groups of worried men in various parts of the country. I don't refer to it as a men's movement. That's that kind of uh, 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 tendency towards making monolithic things of everything that happens. Um, it's helpful to move the S and have men movements so that what's going on is there's a lot of men moving around because the way that we were moving up until 25 years ago doesn't work anymore. For the last decade, Minnesota poet Robert Bly and Seattle-based storyteller Michael Mead have been at the forefront of what some are calling a men's movement. Bly and Mead have worked together since 1981, teaching and performing at workshops and conferences across North America. In their popular men's workshops, they explore the spiritual side of manhood through poetry, storytelling, and discussion. They recently returned to Minnesota for the sixth annual Minnesota Men's Conference. In the next hour, you'll hear, in interviews and in a performance of poems and stories, some of their current thoughts on being a man. This is a poem called Finding the Father. My friend, this body offers to carry us for nothing, as the ocean carries logs. So on some days, the body wails with its great energy, smashes up the rocks, lifting small crabs that flow around the sides. There's a knock at the door. We don't have time to dress. He wants us to go with him through the blowing and rainy streets to the dark house. We will go there, the body says, and there find the father whom we have never met, who wandered out in the snowstorm the night we were born, and has lived since longing for his child whom he saw only once while he worked as a shoemaker, as a cattle herder in Australia, as a restaurant cook who painted at night. When you light the lamp, you will see him. He is sitting there behind the door the eyebrows so heavy, the forehead so light, lonely in his whole body, waiting for you. The main uh, thing that's, that I feel strongly is that we have a situation with men now uh, for the first time in 5,000 years or something, uh, we have the men leaving the house to go to work. So they're not with the sons. Primary problem is this increasing remoteness between the father and the son. The Industrial Revolution is only 140 years old. And um, there's a great uh, uh, man in uh, Germany, Alexander Michelik, who wrote the book called Society Without the Father. And he doesn't fool around. He's saying, you know, it isn't that we have a weak father. It's not that we got a remote father. We don't have a father. The society doesn't. Uh, and I began to do this kind of work when, I mean, my daughters were older than my sons. And uh, raising my daughters seemed to me a joy. But when the sons came along, it was perfectly clear that this is a problem. And uh, I think uh, most men feel that because if they've had problems with their father, then they know that their father had problems with their father. Something is coming down the male line here, and you better know what it is if you're going to pass it on. Is that clear? That's where I was. And I realized I didn't know what I wanted to pass on. 
Am I going to pass on everything I got from my father? Are you kidding? If not, what? And what is eccentric and what isn't eccentric? Hmm? So therefore, the good way to learn something is to start to teach it. What happens when the father leaves the house? Well, one thing that happens is, is I'm just trying to phrase this in the book. It works like this. In the ancient times, uh, up until 200 years ago or so, when you worked with your father, and most, mostly night and day, whether you were in a craft culture, a hunting culture, agricultural co uh, culture, your father fed you something on the cellular level. By being a foot or two from him, you received something from him. It wasn't a change in your mind. I don't think so. I think it was a feeding at a cellular level that you received. Another way you can put it is that, is that you got, by being near your father, you got your body retuned to the masculine frequency. Now, the masculine frequency and the female frequency are very different. You were tuned to the female frequency in the womb and for several years afterwards. And if you didn't tune well, you died. So, all of us here knew how to tune to that frequency. And we could hear our mother's voice with the most incredible accuracy, probably in the womb and afterwards, knowing what is going on there. That's a wonderful tuning. It's a wonderful tuning. But somewhere along in that thing, the bodies need to be retuned to the frequency that comes from an adult masculine body. And a lot of young men in this country are living with no adult male in the house. And I remember the police chief of Detroit said the young males that I arrest not only do not know a responsible male, they've never met one. So therefore, I mean, we are, to me, the whole drug thing and all of that is connected with not the stuff being grown in, in, in Peru. It's connected with the father hunger that's so incredibly deep, it's in the cells. And so I just want to look for a moment at that grief that's in there for a lot of the young men in this, in this uh, country who have no fathers at all. So you've got all kinds of um, uh, teenagers uh, who, uh, who don't know if they are men or women, and they try to retune their bodies. I mean, in the, what you see in rock musicians are men trying to retune their bodies by tuning them to each other. It doesn't work very well. But you can see, and gangs are trying to do that. So young men are trying to learn masculinity from each other. But from the ancient point of view, that doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. You can't learn anything from people your own age. And in any case, the ones that have the intense um, sense of the masculine uh, in its joyful aspect, not in its domineering or pentagon aspect. Um, in, our, in Australia, for example, are the old, the old men, the Aborigines. And um, they spend something like 67% of their time, the traditional old men, in working with mythological material, which is primarily with the boys. So the boys are suffering from a starvation then. You can call it father energy or you can call it older man energy, either way. There's a father hunger. There's an old man hunger. That's tremendous. <laughs>